Why hello there! It feels like the morning after the night before when E3 blew into town and was mostly shit, but dropped a few bombshells along the way and suddenly people are excited for games that are coming in the next couple of years and I think we do just need to take a moment to relax and decompress, so I won't really be talking about E3 all that much. But games that have weird ways of saving? That is absolutely my kind of speed. And really, why the hell not? If there's one consistency throughout 99% of games out there, it'll be that they all need to find a way to save your progress. It was a big deal when the original Legend of Zelda came out with battery-backed memory in the game cartridge, making it the first game to allow players to save their progress in any significant way. It wasn't anything too spectacular and a feature we obviously take for granted these days, but especially with a relatively large game like this, it was a necessary feature to stop people from forcing themselves from beating Zelda in one session. Maybe that would have cultivated an early wave of very talented speedrunners. Bit of a lost opportunity there. As you'd expect, while some games know exactly how best to save the video game, the history of getting to that point is littered with horrible and varied case studies of obtuse game design resulting in it actually being quite hard to save. You can blame early technology and maybe developers who didn't know how to use it, but either way, it took a long time to get where we are now where we take the ability to save a game with minimal hassle and conflict for granted. I was under the impression that there wouldn't be a lot to talk about with this topic, but it turns out that there kind of is, since no one knew what to do for the longest time. Reminds me of YouTube, and hey, we sorted that one out in the end. Until we didn't. Every franchise that has been going on for a few decades has its own history of working out how best to implement save files. There was definitely a period of time when games were getting more ambitious, while the means of saving progress wasn't quite keeping up with this rate of progression. I still remember days of playing what I think must have been the DS Pokemon games and having to sit by and wait after asking the game to save a lot of data. Apparently quite the challenge at the time. Pokemon in general has struggled with this since the first two generations had you save every time you want to switch boxes in the PC, and I don't know if that's because they felt they needed this kind of safeguard in place or if there was just that much data that needed nailing down, but other games haven't got that kind of excuse. Other games are just a bit dumb. Before 2003, Pokemon was a strictly handheld franchise. I mean, yeah, of course you had the, the spin-offs like Snap and the Stadium games, but for the, the traditional RPG style of gameplay, it's mostly just handhelds for now. But in 2003, Pokemon Colosseum rode into town and showed the world that you could translate the, the gameplay of the handhelds onto a main console. With absolutely no problems whatsoever. This is probably a bad time for me to claim that I know what I'm talking about, but I think Pokemon Colosseum struggles in a lot of areas because of how ambitious some of this game was. Often in areas that aren't as refined because of some technical reason that I'm not so familiar with. Because it's a 3D Pokemon adventure with very similar mechanics to the mainline games, but it's also a spin-off, so catching Pokemon is very weird now, and so is saving for some reason. Normal games let you save wherever, but Colosseum has you seek out a PC at a Pokemon Center and use that instead. The only reason why that immediately comes to mind is to make the game harder and make it so you can't rely on saving when they start throwing gauntlets at you later, like Mount Battle and its beat 100 trainers in a row bullshit. It definitely can't be technical limitations because the de facto sequel XD Gale of Darkness lets you save anywhere and also has a lot going on in it. It's hard to justify this decision as anything other than a creative one made for one reason or another, but at least it's merely inconvenient rather than something that actively hinders forward progress. You might not think that that could possibly be a thing, but oh man, you don't even... you don't even want to know. But I recommend you keep watching because then you'd know. There's a terrifying world of games out there with limited save files. I don't mean save slots, since that's always likely to be the case to save memory space. I'm talking about any game that actively restricts you to only saving a certain number of times. 
The games that immediately come to mind use save sparingly so that the player has to make a tactical decision on when to save and can't just use them as a crutch before and after every tiny conflict in the game. Resident Evil is kind of cool with this because it's a horror game and works thematically so that you're a little tense about dying because you'll be going back much further than you would otherwise. So horror games, yeah that kind of works with the whole limited save files thing. Action games where you'll probably die a lot more often since there's probably more enemies around? Yeah, how about you go fuck yourself? Let's talk about Tomb Raider, because it was a very important pioneer for the PlayStation, although clearly not enough to make it onto the PlayStation Classic, and in a lot of ways it's stretching itself and the hardware to be ahead of its time. This meant that the original release of the first Tomb Raider game had to rely on save crystals to keep things a little simpler. Never mind that the PC version let you save wherever you wanted, that's just a, a benefit of owning a computer. But the save crystals were alright, I don't mind them so much. What I do mind is that the sequel will let you save at any time, a welcome upgrade as a sign of progress. I personally welcome this new and improved way of not saving like a fucking corpse. However, my main problem is with Tomb Raider 3, where we're inexplicably back to using save crystals, except now you pick them up like highly valued objects and have to use them sparingly, otherwise you get to the end of the game, realize you haven't got any, and then cry as you come to terms with the fact that your self-imposed checkpoints aren't as evenly spread as you'd like them to be. You can save when you want now, which is a nice improvement on the first game, but that is too much power for one man. I think I'm more annoyed with Tomb Raider 3 than with the first one because developer core design had already worked out what to do with the second game, but with the game after that, they went back on it and actually did something which is way worse. Not to mention that when these games eventually wound up on PC, all of them let you save whenever the fuck you wanted. and. It's very hard to play the PlayStation games without this sense of wonderment as to what life will be like elsewhere. You don't play them thinking, wow, I'm really glad I've got a PlayStation. You think, maybe it's time to buy a computer. Do you know what shouldn't be a complicated thing to do in a video game? I mean, basic actions like moving and jumping and firing a gun, but also saving should be up there too. It's such an important action that you'd think any developer with even the slightest, smallest snippet of sympathy for the player would implement it in such a way that doesn't require some serious mental calculations. All I want to do is to be able to stop playing a game and then start playing it at roughly the same point as where I ended. However, Nintendo, of all people, threw a Zelda-shaped curveball into the mix when Majora's Mask came out and had its abstract three-day time limit where you loop the same 72 hours over and over again until the moon doesn't fuck up the world below. Is it even possible to save this game properly? Why yes, because the 3DS remake made this very easy and nowhere near as stupid as the N64 original. And hey, I really like this game, but come the fuck on guys. There's actually two separate ways of saving Majora's Mask, and even then you've still got checkpoints in place to guard against an environmental death or a game over. That's important, since dungeons are where all the big challenges reside, but you'll likely spend more time out in the overworld doing side quests and solving everyone's complicated problems, and saving the game is what I would classify as a complicated problem. Your two main options are to either use the smattering of our statues in the game, which function like the PCs in Pokemon Colosseum, or you can use the Song of Time, which will give you a prompt to also save the game at the same time as going back to the first day. You might wonder why you'd ever do this, since the Owl statues don't force you back to the beginning, but for some stupid fucking reason, saving with the Owl statues is only kinda temporary, since quitting after loading a save doesn't take you back to where you started that save, and instead, it'll be the last time you use the Song of Time and saved that way. Sounds unnecessarily convoluted, right? Now try and get your head around it as a young child, and that is my experience. And yet I still love this game, so that's just how good Majora's Mask is, apparently. It took me a while to make any meaningful progress. I can't begin to imagine why. Saving does make a game a bit easier. If you think back to older games that didn't use saving either because it hadn't been invented and refined by that point or out of a creative choice to make the game harder, it does make it harder because the lack of checkpoints that would be created by saving, you, you have more to worry about. More, more is 
a conflict to you in a way. So, if you make saving harder, you do make the game a lot more challenging, at the cost of kind of being a bit of a dick. Hey, I decided a long time ago that if I was to make a game, I'd be such a dick and do everything in my power to hinder the players of my video game at every possible juncture. Which I think makes me suitably qualified to make a new Crash Bandicoot game if Naughty Dog are hiring. I didn't grow up with Crash, but I did play the PlayStation Originals before the Insane Trilogy came out a few years ago, and it was enough to convince me that these games are hateful pieces of media made by psychotic madmen. I mean, I enjoyed it and would play them again if given the option, but damn guys, the fuck's wrong with you? Nowhere is this exemplified more than trying to save your progress, with Crash Bandicoot veering away from the well-worn path of letting you save at the end of every level, or even halfway through a world, or whatever, and instead, these geniuses did something that only really smart people do? There's an emphasis on completing every level in Crash Bandicoot and collecting all the fruit and stuff. Not only for your own personal satisfaction and not seeing Crash fucking annihilated by boxes, but also because 100% completion of a level will give you a gem which will allow you to perform the embarrassingly fundamental act of saving your game. It's not the only way of saving since you can also beat a bonus stage, but both of these turn an optional task that only some players would pursue into something that is practically required in order to beat Crash Bandicoot without having a ton of issues. Even when you do get around to saving, you have to watch this stupid ad like a mobile game about this mediocre YouTuber reminding his viewer to subscribe if they've enjoyed the video and hit a bell for notifications or whatever. What the fuck is a YouTube? This is 1996! Think about someone playing this game for the first time and dying a bunch of times and not really knowing how to save their progress because doing so is really complicated and requires you to go out of your way to do something that every game should present front and center. Thankfully, not only was this fixed in the remake, but it was fixed in the fucking sequel, so don't even talk to me about this being a technical limitation because they were using the same tech. How did anyone enjoy this game growing up? Here I was, struggling with Majora's Mask, and others were losing their minds over Crash Bandicoot. As long as we both had really frustrating childhoods. I played a lot of GBA games growing up, and I feel like that was perfect exposure to a very interesting vertical slice of different ways of saving a game. You had Pokemon games that let you save anywhere, you had Metroid games that had specific save stations, I think Fire Emblem games were using auto saves, I even remember a Monsters Inc. game that used password saves. There was a little hollow complaining about games not saving like I'd like them to when we had password save systems for the longest time. Back in those days, I remember being big into Yu-Gi-Oh! and any opportunity to play a virtual form of the card game was always something that I was interested in, meaning that I played all the GBA games and loved most of them. What you should realise by now is that I played other games on this list and enjoyed them despite having to negotiate around some really awkward save systems. Yu-Gi-Oh! games take the fucking biscuit, because for whatever reason, a few of them on the GBA decided to have one place in the entire game where you can go to save your game at. Doesn't matter how far you go or how far you journey out on your adventures, the only way to save is by visiting your house at the very beginning of the game and pivoting off of that for the rest of your time playing. It's not difficult to do or anything, but it is super annoying to have to backtrack to and from the game's starting location every time you either lose or need to take a break. It's a really weird design decision because it's a feature that was carried over to at least three of these GBA games. Hey, if you don't think it's a mistake, you're gonna keep doing it until someone tells you otherwise. I'm guessing there was a lot of yes men during production. There could be more, but I make it that Sacred Cards, Reshef of Destruction, and Seven Trials to Glory all use the same incredibly archaic method of saving the game. The helpful thing is that they're not all as hard as each other, and you could maybe get away with something like this if the game in question isn't that tricky. So while it isn't much of an issue in Seven Trials because that game isn't really all that hard, it kind of is in Sacred Cards because of increased difficulty and absolutely is in Reshef of Destruction, which is by far the most challenging of the three and the one game where you really start to feel and notice the distance you have to travel every time you want to save. It won't be an issue on repeat playthroughs because by that time you should know what you're doing, but the first time through? I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Except maybe the guy who designed it. This from Rabbit Luigi, and I think a save system as bad as the one in Reshef Destruction 
it's actually an unintentional glowing endorsement of emulation because normally you'd have to make this giant trek to and from every time you wanted to save. But in an emulator, you just press a couple of buttons and you made a save state and it's really easy. This is how normal civilized people live and it only takes a slightly morally dodgy means of doing so. Then again, morality and legality are not the same thing. Have you got a topic that you'd like me to talk about next week? Make sure you leave a comment about that down below because I'll be taking the most interesting suggestions and making a poll on the next video. In fact, here's one right now that I prepared from last week. I'll be revealing the winner of the poll on Twitter and taking suggestions for games to talk about that are related to that topic. So feel free to follow me over there so we can keep in touch. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.